So I want to pray for this word, and we're going to, we're going to stick to the gospel of Mark as we continue to walk with Jesus in his last week um, on this earth. So Lord, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we, we praise you for the, for the spiritual exercise and the physical exercise this morning. We thank you, Lord, for, for obedience and submission, Father God, and we thank you for this word, Lord. I, I praise you, Lord. I pray for, for hearts that are, that are ready to receive this word and and, and Lord, and apply it, let it saturate their minds to renew their minds and, and let, it, let it permeate them, their bodies as they go forward. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get into the message today. We're continuing in the Gospel of Mark. And I'm going to tell you there's going to be a lot of Scripture. I hope that that's okay. And the one thing that the Lord gave me today to share with you is unless you know God's Word, you cannot know God's power. Unless you know God's Word, you cannot know God's power. And this is important because if you, if you willfully avoid knowing God's word, yet you hope to walk in his will and his power, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I, I spoke with Joshua a couple weeks ago before his first football game. And have you ever played football before? No, American football. How do you know the plays? I'm learning. I'm learning. I said, hey, how'd you do in your football game? I crushed him. Why did he crush him? Because he's learning the place. He's learning. And it's the same thing with the word of the Lord. You can't crush this demonic world if you're not into the spiritual world. So let's stand up and let's read the, the word of Scripture, our anchor Scripture. And we'll read this together as a body. It's from Mark 12, 18, 27. And it's the Sadducees. What about the resurrection? So let's begin as the body. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him. And they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her and he died, nor did he leave any offspring. The third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, you have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore, you are greatly mistaken. Thank you, Lord, for that word, for that word. So here we go again. This is the last week of Jesus' life on this earth. He has been hungry. <clears throat> we saw that when he saw the fig tree. He is tired. It has been a relentless attack upon Jesus the Christ. We've seen the Pharisees and the Herodians just before today's encounter. This is still Tuesday. They got shut down when they came to him to confront him. They were going to trick Jesus asking about paying taxes to Caesar. And we remember how Jesus dealt with that situation. So then the Sanhedrin, they loaded up the Sadducees for their turn. So this is the Sadducees. This is their big shot. And I want to recall, I want you to recall who the players are. We're going to take out our old school paper baseball cards and, and who are the players so we know the game. Remember the Sanhedrin, they're the council. It's 71 elder scribes, scholars, the elites. They serve kind of as the Supreme Court and the government. You got the Pharisees, these are your blue-collar scholars who committed themselves to maintain the integrity of the law, the law of Mosaic, uh, Moses, the Mosaic law, the Torah, which is the first five books in the Bible, and man-made traditions. They equated man-made traditions with the same authority as the word of the Lord. Now, to their credit, they believed in the, in the resurrection. Remember yes, uh, last week, we had the Herodians. They came from Herod the Great, and now Herod Antipas I. And they were not really religious leaders as much as they wanted to stay in power. And by staying in power, they used their influence to work with Rome, to keep Rome happy uh, by keeping the Israelites under control. 
So today, the characters that we're going we're gonna to deal with are the Sadducees. These were your white collar, your elites and your aristocrats. What they did, they didn't go out into the countryside doing the work of the ministry. If you remember, as we've walked through the Gospel of Mark, you always saw the Pharisees show up on the set. <clears throat> The Pharisees were the, always the one given these low-level confrontations. The Sadducees, they stayed in the temple. They controlled the temple. They benefited from control of the temple. These were the cats making money off the, off the corrupted money changers and the, and the defective animals for sacrifice. This is where they stayed. But you see, these guys, they also rejected resurrection. They did not believe, they did not accept in the resurrection or anything supernatural or the angelic. They only accepted the first five books of the Bible, which we know are the Torah, or in the Greek, Pente, Pente meaning five, Pentateuch. They thought, if it ain't written, it ain't real. If it ain't written, it ain't real. So these are the guys. Now it's their turn to come to Jesus and trip him up. I want to ask you, have you ever had one of those days? It's one thing after another. You've had no time to eat or take a break or return your spouse's text, like it's relentless. This is Jesus' day. You see, we're still in Tuesday of Holy Week. He's still in the temple teaching. Remember, for the Passover week, there was about 250,000 people in the city of Jerusalem. It was a madhouse. It was a madhouse. And here Jesus stood in authority. Let that be a lesson to you, believer. No matter what's going on in your life, always stand in the authority of God. Let your cause be greater than your circumstance. You see, he's been in the temple smacking down one challenge after another. And these are from some of the most educated religious leaders in Israel. And they want nothing less than Jesus dead. They want him dead. What I want to, I want to make this point as an equipping moment. You see, a lot of churches, the, the, the teaching, the sermons, they give you the, the children's Sunday school version of Goliath and actually of, of this week. What they do is they minimize the perilous circumstances surrounding Jesus during this time. They portray him as a, as a lovable character, strolling through the streets during Passover week while mean men snarl at him from within the shadows. See, this is not reality. The reality is Jesus knew that there was a brutal end to his life on earth. Jesus knew that it was near. You see, because he was fully man and he was fully God, he knew that he would experience the pain and the suffering of being put to a sacrificial death. You see, being sacrificed, there's no humane way of being sacrificed. It was meant to be excruciating. It was meant to be final. An example from Leviticus, when when the Lord's given the the priest the example of how they're supposed to sacrifice animals before the Lord. From Leviticus it says, He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priest, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. I want to ask you, do you have any idea what it takes to slaughter a bull? I know we got deer hunters in here and fishermen. But do you understand what it physically takes to slaughter an animal? You see, Jesus knew. And he knew that it would happen to him in just a few days. What I tell you is when we started back in this this holy week I want you to carry the the severity. I want you to carry the seriousness of what Jesus is going to and what he's going through. It is only when you carry the full burden of the burden being carried by Jesus fully that you can fully realize and appreciate this time in Jesus' life. Can you fully appreciate what he did for you? What he did for you. So let's get into the gospel. Let's get into the scripture. Mark 12, 18. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying, you see, now it's the Sadducees turn to come to Jesus. Remember, 
They did not believe in resurrection. Re resurrection was a cornerstone to the belief of the Jews. That put them at, at odds with the Jews often. But despite that, they were so blinded by hate and by greed, they were sticking to the belief that there was no such thing as resurrection. Now, the, the, the Torah, the, well, the Old Testament that they, that they claimed to know, if they would go to Ezekiel 37, they would know about resurrection. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, this sa thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these are the bones of the whole house of Israel. They indeed said... Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open the graves and cause you to come up for your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. That, my friends, is resurrection. That is resurrection. But despite what Scripture says, the Sadducees were more worried about themselves, about their favor, about their influence. What they're going to do, they're going to present to Jesus a, a, a ridiculous scenario. And it wasn't, they weren't looking for an answer. They didn't believe in resurrection anyway. What they're trying to do, they're trying to make Jesus look foolish. If Jesus got tangled up, well, there were seven boys. and da, da, da. No, no. You see, they thought that this was their time. This was the best that these elites had to trip up Jesus the Messiah. Let's continue. The Sadducees, now they're going to pop their big question. What was the big question? We read it, we read it in our anchor scripture from Mark 12, 19, 23. Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers I guess they figured, no, oh, that's going to complicate him for a while. The first took a wife and died. He left no offspring. And the second took her and he died, nor did he have any offspring. And the third likewise, so the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, last of all the woman died also. Can you imagine her relief? Can you imagine her relief? She'd been through seven of these boys. Therefore, in the resurrection, these are the Sadducees, in the resurrection, which they do not believe in, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. In their blind hatred of the truth, the Sadducees showed their biblical ignorance. When they say, teacher, Moses wrote to us, they were referring to Deuteronomy um, five, uh, 25, 5 through 10. And I want to read you, this is from the Torah, this is from the Pentateuch. It's so important when we read, remember we said, when we read the Lord, the word of the Lord, be a detective, be an interrogator. Don't just read over something and be, oh, okay. When it says, uh, Moses wrote to us, what did Moses write to us? Well, let me tell you what Moses wrote to us. And it's important because it comes from the Torah, the Mosaic Law, which these Sadducees believed. If it ain't on paper, it didn't happen. Well, let me give you what the paper says. Deuteronomy 25, 5, 10. I should have asked Leah to read these scriptures. There's quite a bit. If brothers dwell to together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed in the name of the dead brother. And I'm going to explain all this in just a second. That his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if that man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, my brother's husband refuses to raise up a name to his brothers in Israel. He will not perform the duty of his husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and they will speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her. Then the brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal. You think you got hard times in your life? He's going to have a sandal removed. Remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and say to him, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house, that his name shall be called in Israel. Now y'all get this. Hang on to your hats. This is scandalous. This is what they're going to call him, the house of him who had his sandal removed. Let me ask, have you ever been called anything worse than that? 
<clears throat> like they're not playing. This is what the Sadducees came to trip up Jesus. What I will tell you, this is not a matter of marriage or resurrection. This is about property and inheritance. Continuing a family's legacy, it required an heir for a clear line of succession. You see, understand, this law was written in the early history of Israel. They're still establishing themselves as a nation of 12 tribes. So to maintain their identity and the integrity of the nation, those tribes and those families, the law required that they protect their inheritance within each respective tribe. So just in a very practical way, if, if Joe gets married to this lady, and then Joe passes away, and then his brother Tom, who still lives with him, Tom's not out there doing his own thing, he's got to come in from the wild, Tom marries the wife, now Joe's passed, and Tom and the wife have a son, they're going to name that son Joe. Why? Because all the family and tribal records are in the name of the oldest son, Joe. That's the practical nature of all this stuff. So Joe's family will maintain the right to property and family legacy. This was their big challenge. It had nothing to do with resurrection and marriage. You see, once you see the truth for yourself, you understand how outrageous this attack was. You understand that people begin the demonic world tries to trip you up with chaos and unanswerable questions. Or let me put it this way, questions that do not deserve your time to answer. There's more important things in this world than answering ridiculous scenarios. But let me tell you, the, the, the value of Deuteronomy 25, 5, 10, I'll give you a practical application. If you remember during the summer, we had our Summer of Love series about, about Ruth and Boaz. And if you remember that Ruth's father-in-law, Elimelech, which I told you in the summer, it's a fun name to say, try it after you go, when you go home, Elimelech. Um, Elimelech was her father-in-law, and, and he moved out of God's presence. He left, brought him into a pagan land, and Elimelech died, and the two sons died. So here's Ruth. Ruth has got no one in the family to marry. So what does she do? So she returns with Naomi, and she meets Boaz. Remember, Boaz is a distant relative who's qualified as someone who could keep the family name of Elimelech alive. He's what they're called a kinsman redeemer. He's got the ability, the authority, the legal authority to redeem the name of Elimelech's family. Now, why is that important? Family legacy and, and, and law and structure? Well, I will tell you, it's through the marriage, the redemption of Ruth through Boaz, that the marriage would come the line of King David. And through King David, Jesus. You see, it's important for maintaining family lineage, family legacy. But I will tell you, it's still not an issue of resurrection. And as another equipping moment, church, I just want to share with you, look at the way Jesus is handling these people. Now, these are the most learned, earthly people in, in, in Israel. And, and they're trying to grapple with Jesus. And he don't get wrapped up with that. Think about the trolls on Facebook and social media that try to get you tied up. You don't even know who they are. Don't waste your time arguing with the demonic. Every time you come back with a snarky reply, you're wasting an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've shared with you before. If not us, who? If you're not sharing the gospel, if you're not sharing your testimony, who is? So let's keep walking through the gospel, through the message. Mark 12, 24. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not <clears throat> therefore mistaken, because you do not know the Scripture nor the power of God? These are the two most important points I want you to pick up today. We must know God's Word. Not your emotions, not how you feel. What does God say? We also must know God's sovereign power. So when Jesus says mistaken in the Greek, it's planeo. He says you must, you're mistaken. Planeo. It means you've been seduced to wander. You've been seduced to wander from the path of virtue to sin. What Jesus is saying is that they're ignorant because they choose to not know what Scripture says. <clears throat> 
If you're telling me, well, I don't know what the Bible says, and you got this thing full of dust on your nightstand, you choose to not know what God says. Or your app, or whatever way that you, that you can consume the Word of the Lord. They're making a choice to not know what Scripture says. They're being led away through willful ignorance of Scripture and God's power. Had they known Scripture, they'd have known God's power revealed through what? Scripture. Scripture. People say, I want to know what God's got for my life. Did you read His Word? Did you read the letter He wrote to you? No. Let's start there. So Mark 12, 25 says, well, let's go. What about marriage? Look, there were some people upset this week. They were texting. I want to know. Will I be married after I go to heaven? Mark 25, 12, 25 says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor given in marriage. So I'm going, to rank, I'm going to yank the bandage off on this one. No, there's no marriage in heaven. Well, there's one. We the bride to Christ the groom. You see, the concept of marriage is for life on earth only. Marriage is for for sex and multiplication of the population and relationship. This is necessary. Marriage on earth is a necessity to grow and sustain life on earth. We know this because Genesis 1.28 said, Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and what? Multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What I will share is, is when we, in the resurrection, we are one body unified in Christ. There are no private relationships to distract or detract us from worshiping God. All relationships will center on God. This is why it's so important to be spirit-led, not emotion-led. Like, well, I'm going to miss that old girl. I'm going to miss that guy. I know he drives me crazy, but I'm a, you're not going to miss him. You can't take earthly emotions and relay them into a supernatural, eternal atmosphere. I will tell you, and people say, well, what are we going to look like when we're resurrected? A lot of, a lot of believers don't want to talk about the resurrection. They don't want to hear about the resurrection. I like what I got going on here. Do you? Do you? If you realize what it's going to be, When it all falls away, you don't want none of this stuff here. Philippians tells us in 321, He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like His own, using the same power which He will bring everything under His control. What are you going to look like in the resurrected state? You're going to be incredible. You're going to be incredible. And I want to give you some resurrection reassurances. I don't want you to be afraid of the resurrection. Because I'm going to tell you, it ain't far from now. We are in the last of the last days. The times are becoming more and more perilous. If you will read the scripture and see the signs of the times, we're not meant, like I said, to be a toddler at a birthday party, gasping at gifts and screaming at balloons. We're meant to be mature and prepared. We're meant to be equipped. So I want to give you some, some reassurances. I get asked all the time, well, well, what about the people in our lives, like our spouses and our kids, and, and maybe the people that have passed away before us? Like, what about my parents? Am I going to see them again? I want to give you some, some reassurance. And, and they'll put the scripture up there, but for the sake of time, uh, I won't read the scripture. I'll just reference it and what it means. But Matthew 17, 1 through 3. This is the transfiguration of Jesus. You see, the disciples recognized him. They also recognized Moses and Elijah. They'd never met Moses and Elijah. They didn't see their Facebook page or their website or anything like that. They recognized them. Will we recognize each other? Yes, we will. Matthew 8, 11. Jesus, he teaches the people will come from the east and the west, and they will sit with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Because why? Because we're going to know who they are. We're going to recognize them. We're going to recognize each other. 1 Corinthians 3.12, Paul wrote, We're going to know each other more fully in heaven than we can ever know now. Why? Because we'll recognize each other. Because we'll know each other. Because we're all members of the body of Christ. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Paul had to comfort the church by reassuring them that they would be reunited with their loved ones. The ones who had died in Christ. Let me be very clear. The ones who died in Christ. And this was a little, this was a little bit of Scripture, so I'll, I'll let, I want it to sit up there for a bit. I want you to have the same reassurance in the resurrection. I also want to put an put a unction in your spirit. Those folks out there, those family members, those co-workers, those people we see and like, uh. Lee and I were praying about it this weekend, and it's like, man, I just how do you how do you how do you get the message? How do you get it to the body? And and I just think about if we think about the people that we love in our lives that have not come to receive the Lord. I want you to realize that unless they receive the Lord as their Savior before they pass, or they may not even pass, we may be we may be taken up before that day. The Lord says some won't see death. I want that to be an encouragement to you to start sharing the gospel, to bring them into righteous salvation. Now, last question I get a lot of is, um, like if if I get up there and I don't see somebody, they never receive Christ, am I going to miss them? Well, that's a hard question. And I sure don't know anything except for what the Lord says. And Revelation 21.4 tells us, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I just want to encourage you. We are a three-part being. Our physical body, our soul, which is our mind, our memories, our personality, and our spirit. I want you to be spirit-led. Let the word of the Lord guide you. Some people will say, oh, I don't believe. I think they're going to be married. I don't care what you say. We're always going to be together. Amen. You will be. But I encourage you. I love your feelings. But I care more about what the Word of the Lord tells you. So let's get back to these Sadducees that show in their biblical ignorance. You see, what they were doing, they were implying by giving this ridiculous scenario of not just two brothers, like, like uh, Deuteronomy said, brother, brother, who's living together. We're going to go seven brothers. We're going to make it crazy. We're going to get Jesus so stumped up and trumped up, he's not even going to know what he's talking about. What they, what they don't understand is that they don't even think God's got the power to, number one, resurrect, but do they really think God's going to sit up there worrying about who married to who? That's because they don't know the word of the Lord and they don't know the power of God. The only way you'll know the power of God is if you know what, what the word says about who God is. Let's continue, Mark 12, 25. But are like angels. Will not be given in marriage, but will, are, will be like angels. Jesus uses this as a comparative example. Since the Sanhedrin's Don't even believe in angels or the supernatural. And when he says like angels, some translation says as angels. In the Greek, the word is hos. And it's a conjunction that's formed between a relative pronoun. It's used to make a comparison. This like that. Jesus is using this to help define what it's going to be like. He does not say we will be angels. And church, if I step on your toe... Take it as love. When people die, they do not get wings. They do not become angels. It grieves me to see believers. Oh, so-and-so got his wings. Look, I know this is said to make people feel better. And I don't mean, I'm not making light of this. But church, as believers we got to be better in giving false comfort to people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Look, if being in the presence of God is not enough comfort, I don't know what is. I'll ask you, if you did it, don't do it anymore. But you see how our feelings take the lead? Our soul, what we call a solar coaster, 
I just know, oh, so-and-so got his wings. Have you read the biblical account of what angels? No. I want to be in my transfigured state in the presence of the Lord. Give the truth of the word. So what does it mean like to be like angels? Well, number one, there's no marriage. This earthly institution of marriage will not exist in heaven. We become the bride. Christ is the groom. We will have immortality. People will have eternal life. You will have eternal life. Free from the limitations and mortality of an earthly existence. What I will tell you, John 3.16, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, your eternal life, you're already living it. Your eternal life with Christ, you're already living it. Because you've got the Holy Spirit indwelled with you. When you pass from this life, this old skin suit is going to go into the ground. But your soul, you're going to continue living in the presence of the Lord. Spiritual nature, like an angel. We're going to share in the spiritual nature of angels. This means living in a glorified spiritual state, fully in the presence of God. Fully in the presence of God. You see, you've got the 100% righteousness of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But what, what diminishes that is the sin in our life, the rebellion in our life, the flesh. But once we're freed from these old skin suits, it's full spirit, full time. And like the angels' purity and glory, the resurrected life will be characterized by purity and glory, similar to the angels. So let's go on. Mark 12, 26. Have you not, this is Jesus, have you not read the book of Moses? The Mosaic law, the book of Moses, is the what? The Torah. This is what the Sadducees say. If it ain't that book, it ain't happening. And Jesus is directly challenging them. And he's saying, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore, you're greatly mistaken. Jesus is referring to the law, the Torah. And when Jesus talks about the burning bush, you say, well, what, is, what situation was that? Well, that's Exodus 3.6. Moreover, he said, this is God, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. This is Jesus speaking from the Old Testament. This is Jesus not getting all in his fields, but he's sticking to the word of the Lord. You see, when God spoke to Moses, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they had already died natural deaths. They had already died natural deaths. But despite their physical deaths, you see, God uses the present tense, I am, not I was or I used to be. He's talking current, present tense. Why? Because Abraham and Isaac and Jacob live eternally. And God continues as their God because they are living eternally. See, to be their God, they must worship Him as God. And God is not worshipped by corpses. He is worshipped by the living. The same way that God will be your God in this time and in after the resurrection. Every person will live forever. But your choice determines where you spend eternity. You see, once again, the Sadducees, they were given the truth and they had a choice to make. They could accept the truth of the word of the Lord based on the word that they said was the law, which is, is the law, the Mosaic law, the first five books of Torah, or they could reject it. They were given an opportunity to come into correction, not on Jesus' emotions, but on the simple word of the Lord. And they walked away. We have the same choice to receive his word. As a believer, we have that choice to receive his word in correction and edification. So I always ask you to choose wisely. Choose wisely. And Kurt, if you want to come up. So we're going to continue walking through this scripture. Let's get to where we're wrapping it up. And this is what I say is the icing on the cake. Mark 12, 27. And Jesus says, you are therefore greatly mistaken not just mistaken greatly mistaken 
You see, because they willingly choose to remain ignorant, despite having access to the Scriptures. The same Scriptures that reveal God's nature and character. Yet they fail to understand God's power. You are greatly mistaken. Jesus is explaining to them the resurrection hope. The power of God. I want to ask you, are you living with the hope of resurrection? Are you living in the hope of resurrection? I know we like our things. I like these loafers. I've worn them the last four weeks. But I'm not willing to give up my eternal life in the presence of God for a five-year-old pair of loafers. What are you clinging to? What are you clinging to in your life? Well, I want to cling to my spouse. Well, if you're both believers, you'll be up there for eternity. Are you, are you living with the hope of resurrection? I will tell you, to let go of the things of this earth, start looking up, looking onward, looking forward. And I thank you for letting me spend a little time talking about the reassurances of resurrection. Because in the, in the Western churches, if you're not preaching the word of the Lord, there's a fear of resurrection. When they say we're in the end of the end times. And if you've got your life right with Christ and you've received Him as your Savior, there should be no fear in what comes next. If you haven't, then let's talk after church. But are you living with the hope of resurrection? There is a glorious, eternal life waiting for you. You see, you must know what the Bible says about resurrection, to live in the hope of what will be and not the fear of what once was. If you know what the Scriptures say, then you also know God's power. If you feel like you're living a powerless life, if you feel like you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, then you're living out of your own ability. You're living on a solar coaster, S-O-U-L. You're living on your emotions. I challenge you to be spirit-led. To be spirit-led. What does the word of the Lord say? I know what my bank account says. But I know what the word of the Lord says. I know what the doctor said. But I know what the word of the Lord says. I know what mainstream media says. But I know what the word of the Lord says. You see, you get to choose. You get to choose. I just encourage you to choose wisely. You see, resurrection does not happen because you die. It happens because you chose to live. I want you to live fully in the power of God. And that only comes by knowing what Scripture reveals about God's power. Joshua could not have crushed it at a high school football game if he didn't know what the playbook said. This is a high school football game. We're talking about eternal life. I want you to walk in power. I want you to walk in authority. God wants you to have everything because he gave everything for you. He gave his son, Jesus Christ. So the one thing that I will share with you is unless you know God's word, you cannot know God's power. Church, I encourage you to, to read the word of the Lord. I will ask you to stand and I will pray us out. If you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I offer you this opportunity to make the rational decision to receive Jesus as your Savior. You can come up front, make a public declaration of faith, or, or speak with me or the elders afterwards. I encourage the saints that have received the Lord to let this message today 
put a burden on their hearts, on your hearts, to share the gospel message to those who have not received. I will tell you <clears throat> that we are in the end of days, the last of the end of days. So if you would, if you would, I just ask you if you're comfortable to, to close your eyes and, and not to be traditional or anything. I just don't want you to be distracted. I just want you to pray. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what is He saying to you? There is a corporate move of the Holy Spirit. And even if we gathered all the prophets in the front, they could not share the words that the Lord has for each one of you individually. So I ask you, because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, simply ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me right now? And I want you to be willing to receive that word. So Lord, we thank you, Father. We praise you. Thank you for the good word of the gospel of Mark. Thank you for the example of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the eternal word. Father, thank you for salvation and resurrection. Oh, what a glorious day that'll be. What a glorious day that'll be. So, Lord, I, I pray for this body. I pray that, that you continue to fill us with an urgency to, to share the gospel. Lord, I, I, I'm going to pray. I'm going to bind up any spirit of, of fear or timidity or shyness or bashfulness or hesitation. Lord, any spirit that will stop us from sharing our testimony and the gospel message. Anything that creates a hesitation in our hearts. I bind that up in Jesus' name. I bind that up for the corporate body of this church to take away, to bind up and cast out any spirit of pride, of hesitation, of timidity. What are they going to think of me? What are they going to say? I loose a spirit of love and compassion. I loose a spirit of urgency over this body that they feel the unction of the Holy Spirit prompting them, pushing them, compelling them to share a simple gospel message. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. Lord, it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen, amen, hallelujah, amen. Thank you, Lord.